Peace be upon you. So we have absolutely so much to be thankful for. And oftentimes, you know, myself, I take it for granted. I remember uh, I just did my uh, Salat the other day. And for some reason, it occurred to me what a blessing it is to be able to just walk in, do your contact prayers, to be able to prostrate, to be able to walk, run, do all these things. Imagine if you didn't have functional legs, like how difficult life would be. Uh, just to be able to get around, to be able to get up, to be able to do daily tasks that you know we each take for granted. Or if you didn't have eyes, how difficult it would be to navigate the world, uh, to not be able to watch a movie, uh, for all the entertainment our eyes provide, or to be able to even be able to see the faces of those you love, to be able to see them smile, to giggle, to uh, laugh, to make eye contact. You know, what an absolute blessing. Or the fact that you can hear you're listening to this podcast, or let's say better than this podcast, you're listening to a, a song that brings this nostalgic feeling back, uh, that gives you this feel, you know, good feeling when you listen to it. Uh, what an absolute blessing. Or you taste food, uh, be it ice cream or a candy bar or a, a piece of steak. And the fact that you can taste all these flavors, how absolutely awesome is that? And God tells us in the Quran, in Surah 16, verse 18, it says, if you count God's blessings, you cannot possibly encompass them. God is forgiver, most merciful. And the way I understand this verse is saying, even if we try to count all of God's blessings, we would never be able to. But God knows this, and he says he's forgiver, most merciful. But it's the element, are we trying to reflect and be thankful? Or do we fixate on what's not working out, what doesn't live up to our satisfaction? And if we overemphasize the aspects that we see as frustration, as problematic, rather than all the blessings God has given us. And I don't care who you are on this planet. There is still so many blessings that God has given us. You know, we don't deserve our eyes. We don't deserve our legs. We don't deserve this taste. This is a blessing that God has provided for us, for nothing, for us to be able to enjoy, to become appreciative. But the other day, we were uh, eating a dinner at my uh, mother-in-law's house, and they cooked this delicious T-bone steak. And they had Brussels sprouts, and it was like, just, it was so delicious. And, um, you know, we're eating, and then there's all these flies that come on, uh, come around, and they're trying to sit in the food, and, you know, uh, just being annoying in that sense. And for a moment, I was thinking, ah, getting upset that these flies were here. And I was forgetting, I said, oh my God, I have this delicious steak, this absolutely perfectly cooked steak. This animal gave its life for me to be able to enjoy. And here I am complaining about the flies and forgetting about the blessing. God warns us about this in 1434 and says, and he gives you all kinds of things that you implore him for. If you count God's blessings, you can never encompass them. Indeed, the human being is transgressing unappreciative. Rather than being appreciative of God for creating this delicious food, allowing me to have it in comfort and peace uh, with family, I got fixated on these flies and I could have thought of these flies that these are God's creations. One of the parables in the Quran is that if all the jinns and all the humans came together, they could not produce one fly. And even if they did, if the fly consumed anything, could they get it back? And this is a parable in the Quran. And rather than reflecting on God's majesty, God's glory, you know, I got fixated on this problem. And this becomes problematic in itself. Because when we fixate on the problem rather than the blessing, all we're doing is we're showing that we're unappreciative. And this is a, uh, a test for us. And God wants to see, are we going to take these blessings that God has given us? And is it going to draw us closer to God or repel us away from him? In 4150, it says, And when we bless him after suffering some adversity, he says, This belongs to me. I do not believe that the hour will ever come to pass. Even if I'm returned to my Lord, I will find at him better things. Most certainly, we will inform the disbelievers of all their works and will commit them to severe retribution. And in 1783, says, when we bless the human being, he becomes preoccupied and heedless. But when adversity strikes him, he turns despondent. And we have to always just reflect on the blessing, how good things are, to understand that everything that happens in our life happens for a good reason, to be steadfast. But if we fixate on just what's wrong and we complain and we become bitter and we just focus on the, 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 the things, again, that we think are problematic, that aren't living up to our uh, satisfaction, then all we're doing is we're repelling ourselves from God. And the choice is up to us which one we choose. And a perfect example of how God gives us so many blessings, and actually these blessings ends up turning to idols, something that repels from God, 
is in the example of the children of Israel. So when uh, Moses and the children of Israel left Pharaoh and God saved the children of Israel and drowned Pharaoh and his troops, the uh, children of Israel had all this jewelry, uh, had these uh, gold and silver. And it actually explains this in the, uh, the Bible in Exodus 12, uh, 31 through 36. The reason they had all this golden jewelry was because when the uh, uh, children of Israel were allowed to go by Pharaoh, um, the Egyptians wanted them out because they were scared that they were going to be uh, wiped out if they continued to, to stay there. So first they provided them bread and dough and uh, the children of Israel in return asked the Egyptians that, hey, you know what would really help is some, uh, some of your gold and silver and uh, jewelry. And the Egyptians willfully gave it to them because they just wanted them to leave. And because of this, God allowed them to leave with freedom, with liberty, without uh, elimination of uh, persecution. And they were independent people. But they turned this blessing into a curse. And it's explained in Surah 20, verse 87, where it reads, They said, We did not break our agreement with you on purpose. And this is the children of Israel talking to Moses. And it continues, says, But we were loaded down with jewelry and decided to throw our loads in. That is what the Sumerians suggested. He produced for them a sculpted calf complete with calf sounds. They said, This is your God, the God of Moses. Thus he forgot. Could they not see that it neither responded to them nor possess any power to harm them or benefit them? Now, here is God blessing these people, provided them not only the, the freedom of uh, persecution, uh, being able to uh, uh, have liberty, to be able to have family, community, um, yet, and God also gave them jewelry, wealth. But they said, you know what? This jewelry, it loaded us down. It was too heavy to carry. So we thought a better idea was we'll mold this into a golden calf and worship that instead. And we read these stories and say, this is ludicrous. How did they become so unappreciative? How did they take this blessing that God has given them and turn it into an idol? But the sad reality is we do the same thing. When God gives us a blessing, rather than realizing the blessing from God, we turn this blessing into an idol that just repels us from God. And this can either happen because we turn unappreciative, because we start complaining, we start uh, thinking of all the, the, the things that's wrong with this blessing, or it's because we give so much value to this blessing that we forget that the person who gave it to us, the source of the blessing was God. And either way, it's wrong. You know, so many of us, God has blessed us with so many things, be it with intellect, with looks, with uh, charisma, with friendships, with status, maybe the country you reside, the, the money you have, the job title you have, the car you drive, you know, these things that God has given us to allow us to be appreciative, to draw closer to him. Some of us, we end up turning these items into idols that only draw us further away from God. Or God blesses us with something and rather than being appreciative for it, we complain. We say, it's not good enough. Why can't it be better? Why can't it be like this? Why did it have to be like that? And we'll see examples of this in the Quran. So the first example I want to look at is from Surah 2, verse 61, where it reads, Recall that your Lord said, O Moses, we can no longer tolerate one kind of food. Call upon your Lord to produce for us such earthly crops as beans, cucumbers, garlic, lentils, and onions. He said, Do you wish to substitute that which is inferior for that which is good? Go down to Egypt, where you can find what you ask for. They have incurred condemnation, humiliation, and disgrace, and brought upon themselves wrath from God. This is because they rejected God's revelations and killed the prophets unjustly. This is because they disobeyed and transgressed. Now, God just saved these people from Pharaoh's persecution, gave them liberty, gave them freedom. And not only did they create a golden calf to worship, now they're complaining about the provisions they have. You know, God in the Bible tells us that he gave them manna and quails. So protein, things that they need, that's nourishment for them. But what they wanted, they were saying, we want, you know, beans, cucumbers, garlic, lentils, onions. And there's nothing wrong with these provisions that they're asking for. But it's the fact that they were saying, we can no longer tolerate one kind of food. They wanted diversity. They weren't satisfied with what God gave them. And in return, they showed that they're unappreciative. Rather than focusing on what is good, what's working out for them, all the blessings they have, they get fixated on the fact that they were only given one kind of food. And because of that, they repelled themselves from God's message and they dropped out. They basically proved that they weren't true believers. What a sad state of affairs. And it's one of these things that we should always be appreciative for what God gives us because God knows exactly what we need when we need. And if we trust in God and if we're appreciative, God is going to give us more. In Surah 14, verse 7, it says, 
The more you thank me, the more I give you. But if you turn unappreciative, my retribution is severe. So rather than saying, you know, God, I can't tolerate any more uh, any kind of food. Instead, we should be, God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for the man and quails. Thank you for saving us from Pharaoh's people, from the troops, from the persecution, granting us liberty, allowing us to worship you freely. And in return, God will give them more because he sees that by giving them blessings, they become appreciative. They draw closer to God. But if he was to give them more, it shows that they just become more unappreciative. From the Quran, we learn that whatever occupies our mind most of the day becomes our idol. If we start circulating our lives around things that God has blessed us with rather than God alone, then these items, these blessings that God has given us become our idols. And in 33, 41 through 42, it reads, O you who believe, you shall remember God frequently. You shall glorify him day and night. As a submitter, every time we see something that God has given us, a blessing, it's an opportunity to reflect on God, to be appreciative of God, to say subhanAllah, to say mashallah, to be able to recognize the source of this joy isn't this blessing that God gave us, but it's God alone. And um, once we come to that conviction, you know, we can enjoy the things of this world, but know that our priority is with God in the hereafter. During a sermon last week, the uh, person given the sermon made an awesome comparison. He said this life is like salt water in the sense that someone who tries to drink of this life, no matter how much of it they drink, they're never going to quench their thirst and it's only going to leave them more dehydrated. But making the hereafter our priority is like someone who's drinking fresh water. It's going to satisfy the body and the soul in this life and in the hereafter. In 2439, it reads, as for those who disbelieve their works are like a mirage in the desert. A thirsty person thinks that it is water, but when he reaches it, he finds that it is nothing. And he finds God there instead to requite him fully for his works. God is the most efficient reckoner. In 1314, it reads, imploring him is the only legitimate supplication, while the idols they implore beside him cannot ever respond. Thus, they are like those who stretch their hands to the water, but nothing reaches their mouths. The supplication of the disbelievers are in vain. If we make this life our priority, we are never going to be fulfilled. We're always going to be more thirsty for this world to try to fill that void. But if we make the hereafter in pleasing God our priority, we're going to be satisfied in this world and in the hereafter. And that's the best blessing we can have. So let's look at some of these examples in the Quran, how God is giving individuals blessings and how these individuals made these blessings into idols only to repel them from God. The first example is that of children. In 7189 through 191 it reads, He created you from one person, Adam. Subsequently, he gives every man a mate to find tranquility with her. She then carries a light load that she can hardly notice. As the load gets heavier, they implore God, their Lord, If you give us a good baby, we will be appreciative. But when he gives them a good baby, they turn his gift into an idol that rivals God. God be exalted far above any partnership. Is it not a fact that they are idolizing idols who create nothing and are themselves created? Now, many people obviously strive to one day have a family, to have children, to have good children at that. And God blesses so many individuals with this gift. But how many people turn this gift into an idol by prioritizing their children over worshiping God? And you see this time and time again. People implore God for these things. They say, God, please give us a good child. If you give us a good child, we're going to be such good submitters. We're going to be, you know, worshiping all the time, doing righteous work. And what happens? God gives them this child. And then all of a sudden, that child becomes their number one priority in this life, above that of God. And when they do that, they lose both in this life and in the hereafter. Because the real reality is things of this world, when we put our trust in them, they're going to disappoint us. The only thing that is never going to disappoint us when we put our entire trust in is that of God. If we put our trust wholeheartedly in God, we're never going to be disappointed. He's going to allow us to enjoy these blessings, be it children or anything else, in this world and in the hereafter. But you see, people who make their joy dependent on their children, what happens is their children become a source of misery for them. And God actually tells us about this in the Quran. In Surah 64 verse 14, it reads, O you who believe your spouses and your children can be your enemies. Beware, 
if you pardon, forget, and forgive, then God is forgiver most merciful. These things that we put so much love into, the fact that we're putting our love into our spouses and our children, in return, if they disappoint, if they turn against us, it's going to be the most hurtful thing. Because if a stranger despises you or does something to disappoint you, you really don't have a baseline of expectation. But if it happens from your spouse or your children, then this could be a source of misery. In 985 says, do not be impressed by their money or their children. God causes these to be sources of misery for them in this world and their souls depart as disbelievers. Anything that we prioritize over God, we are going to lose. We are going to uh, be a source of pain and misery for us. The only way we can preserve that to make it into something righteous is by always prioritizing God over anything else, over our spouses, our children, our family, our job, anything, because this is the source of joy. God is the source of righteousness. God is the source of joy. And when we make God a priority, he's going to allow these blessings that we have to draw us closer to him and to be advantageous in this world and in the hereafter. One of the prayers in the Quran in 25, uh, starting from 73, but it's in 74, it tells us what we should say. It says, when reminded of their Lord's revelations, they never react to them as if they were deaf and blind. And they say, our Lord, let our spouses and children be a source of joy for us and keep us in the forefront of the righteous. That is the ultimate goal, to have our spouses and children to be a source of joy for us, but also to be able to keep us in the forefront of the righteous, that we don't lose our priority, that our priority is always to worship God alone, to dedicate our worship practices, our life, our death only to God and to nothing else. The second form of idol that we see uh, specified in the Quran is that of uh, property. And you can think of it also in the sense of a business, something of that you've worked for, that you, you uh, put uh, your blood, sweat and tears into with the hope of getting something in return. And we see an awesome example in Surah 18, verse 32 through 38. Um, and uh, it reads, Cite for them the example of two men. We gave one of them two gardens of grapes surrounded by date palms and place other crops between them. Both gardens produced their crops on time and generously, for we caused the river to run through them. Once after harf uh, harvesting, he boastfully told his friend, I am far more prosperous than you, and I command more respect from the people. When he entered his garden, he wronged his soul by saying, I do not think this will ever end. Moreover, I think this is it. I do not think that the hour the hereafter will ever come to pass. Even if I'm returned to my Lord, I will be clever enough to possess an even better one over there. His friend said to him as he debated with him, Have you disbelieved in the one who created you from dust, then from a tiny drop, then perfected you into a man? As for me... God is my Lord, and I will never set up any other God besides my Lord. So up until this point, we have two people to each possess a garden. One of them is boasting to the other one about how awesome he is, how successful he is, how much status he has, uh, how much provisions he's getting from this. And he thinks that the garden is the source of all his blessings. And he's forgetting that the source of the blessing, the fact that he even has a garden, he has status, he has provisions, is because of God. And when he loses light of that, inevitably he's going to fail. And it continues in 1839 through uh, uh, 44. It says, when you entered your garden, you should have said, this is what God has given me. No one possesses power except God. You may see that I possess less money and less children than you. My Lord may grant me better than your garden. He may send a violent storm from the sky that wipes out your garden, leaving it completely barren. Or its water may sink deeper out of reach. Indeed, his crops were wiped out. He ended up sorrowful, lamenting what he had spent on it in vain. As his property lay barren, he finally said, I wish I never set up my property as a god beside my Lord. No force on earth could have helped him against God, nor was it possible for him to receive any help. That is because the only true Lord and Master is God. He provides the best recompense, and with him is the best destiny. Here is someone who put all his wealth, all his uh, status, everything he believed he was, he tied it with his garden, his business, his status, his title. And when it was wiped out, because ultimately God is the one who provided it for him and God is the one who can take it away from him if he's unappreciative, he felt like he was nothing. He lost everything because he put all his, uh, his self into this possession, this material object. And this is the worst kind of loss. 
because he lost in this world and he lost in the hereafter for something so petty, a garden. You know, right now you can go to the grocery store and have whatever you want. But here at this time, this person, it seemed like this was the, the status, you know, the, 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 the highest ranking status of this world. Now you take someone who believes, you know, they're a CEO, they have a big company, they have lots of money, they have cars, they have this, they have that. They think this is the source of their joy. This is the source of their success. And the second they do that, God is going to take it away. And when they take it away, what's left? Nothing. And they lose both in this world and in the hereafter. God continues in 1845, says, Cite for them the example of this life is water that we send down from the sky to produce plants of the earth. Then they turn into hay that is blown away by the wind. God is able to do all things. What I take away from this parable is that God is the one who causes the, the seeds to crack and to germinate. That plants come, this is by design of our Lord. But at a certain time, it's going to turn into hay. Its life expectancy is going to end and you're going to be left with nothing. If you think your provision comes from this plant, we're mistaken. The provision comes from God, his design, his calculations, everything that he provides for us. This is where the source of the provisions come from. If we think it comes from, you know, the clouds, the ground, the seed, we're mistaking ourselves because God is the one who created all this. And we have to be cognizant of that. If we tie our value with things of this world, this is the reason that you think that you're a valuable person is because of the things in this world that you have, the vanities, the money, the status, the, uh, the, the, the family, the children, the connections, then at some point you're going to lose that. And when you do, what is left? So we don't want to make this mistake. God continues in 1846. It reads, money and children are the joys of this life. But the righteous works provide an eternal recompense from your Lord and a far better hope. So let's not make the priority this life. Let's make the priority the hereafter. And the way we do that is we realize all these blessings that God has given us. One, it's for us to be appreciative. Two, we never should assume that these are the reasons we're happy, we're joyful. The reasons we're happy, we're joyful is because of God, the source of all this. All these blessings we have is because God gave them to us. And if we mistake the gift from the giver, then we're going to be thinking that the gift is what gives us happiness. And it's not. It's the giver, God. God is the one who gives us these blessings. Another similar example in the Quran is in Surah 68, and it starts from verse 17. It says, We have tested them like we tested the owners of the garden who swore that they will harvest in the morning. They were so absolutely sure. And these are individuals who believe that they did everything necessary in order to be successful in this world. They had a garden, they tended to it, and they're ready to just, you know, harvest, to take the fruit, take the uh, provisions from it. And it continues in verse 19, it says, a passing storm from your Lord passed by while they were asleep. By morning, it was barren. They called on each other in the morning, let us harvest the crop. On their way, they confined to each other that from then on, none of them would be poor. They were so absolutely sure of their harvest. But when they saw it, they said, we were so wrong. Now we have nothing. And it continues uh, in verse 28, it says, The righteous among them said, If only you had glorified God. They said, Glory be to our Lord, we have transgressed. They started to blame each other. They said, Woe to us, we sinned. May our Lord grant us a better one. We repent to our Lord. Such was the requital, but the retribution of the hereafter is far worse if they only knew. Here's individuals who thought that because of the work they did, they were guaranteed success. And because they forgot God, and it says in the subtitle, they should have said God willing. When they said they're going to get the harvest, that they're going to be uh, successful, they should have acknowledged that God is the source of this. Their success is not coming from this world. Their success is only guaranteed by God. But the second we forget about God and we think that it's because of the, our cleverness or the hard work we put in and uh, we attribute that to our success, we're going to be sorry. And this is the reality, is if you're planning on doing something in the future that you believe that, look, you've done the hard work, you rolled up your sleeves and you got what was needed to be done, we have to still acknowledge that God willing, God is going to make this successful because God is the one who controls everything. So we saw that if you think status, children, these things, if we think these things are what is going to provide us happiness, we're wrong. If we set these things up as idols, we're only going to be disappointed. Another one is putting the priority of what other people say above that what of God says. God tells us if we do this, then we would be idol worshipers because ultimately the word that we have to accept above all else is that of God's. 
God tells us in the example in 6.121, says, Do not eat from that upon which the name of God has not been mentioned, for it is an abomination. The devils inspired their allies to argue with you. If you obey them, you will be an idol worshiper. So God is telling us that, look, if God gives us advice, God tells us something that, hey, before you say you're going to do anything in the future, you should say God willing to glorify God when you see something that you find beautiful, that you, uh, you appreciate. If someone's going to argue the counter to that, to say, no, that's not what you do. You have to do this other thing. If we accept someone else's word above that of God's, then what we're doing is we're setting that individual up as an idol. So for instance, God tells us that the ablution is four steps. If I add five steps or nine steps, then I'm following a source beside God. God in this verse 6.121 is telling us that before we eat any food, we mention God's name. Now, if someone says, no, no, you don't do that, don't mention God's name, and we choose to follow that person, then we're setting that person up as a God. Anytime we accept any information from a different source other than what God says in the Quran, God's message to mankind, what we're doing is we're following the way of Satan. In 3660, it says, Did I not covenant with you, O children of Adam, that you shall not worship the devil, that he is your most ardent enemy, and that you're, you shall worship me alone? This is the right path. The devil is the alternative. The devil wants us to repel from God, that God tells us to be appreciative, and we decide to be unappreciative, then we're following the way of the devil. If God tells us to make God our priority, the hereafter our priority, we choose to make this life our priority, we choose to make our children, our spouses, our business our priority instead of what God tells us about the hereafter, then we're making again, we're siding with the devil. And this is what it means to worship the devil. This is what it means to set up an idol, is that you take some source other than that from God, in regards to your religious salvation. And this is essential because there's a lot of things that God doesn't address in the Quran. But you see people, they make these fabricated rules that, oh, you have to walk into a bathroom with your right foot. And when you sleep, you sleep on your right side and this and that. And there's no foundation, no basis whatsoever in the Quran. But if we believe that you have to follow these things that are external to what's said in the Quran in order to have salvation, again, we're setting up a source beside God. We're setting some other idol. We're taking um, advice about our salvation from someone other than God. Now, this is uh, the, the, the reality. The only source of our salvation, the only source we follow is that of God. And God's word in the Quran is immutable. It's perfectly preserved and it has details for everything. Everything we need to know for a religious salvation is in the Quran. And one of the most conniving idols that we each potentially set up is that of our own ego. God tells us in the Quran in 2543, it says, Have you seen the one whose God is his own ego? Will you be his advocate? When we believe that our understanding is weighed heavier than what God tells us in the Quran, we're making ourselves up as a God beside God. We're saying that our word reigns supreme over God's word. And as a uh, submitter, someone who believes in God, worships God alone, we should always put God's word above that of our own. And this is a, a, a reality because if we don't, then we're setting up our ego as a God. And examples of this is God tells us in the Quran in 590 that intoxicants, gambling, the altars of idols, these are abominations of the devil that they should be avoided. But if we think that, no, you know, I can have intoxicants, I can drink alcohol, I can smoke weed, um, you know, these aren't uh, what God is talking about, then we're putting our ego above that of God's word because God's word reigns supreme. We should never put our own opinions above that of God's. Now, we're each going to come away with our own understanding, but that understanding has to come from God, has to come from the Quran, and has to be without any contradictions. God tells us in the Quran in 924, proclaim, if your parents, your children, your siblings, your spouses, your family, the money you have earned, a business you worry about, and the homes you cherish are more beloved to you than God and his messenger and striving in his cause, then just wait until God brings his judgment. God does not guide the wicked people. Our number one priority in this world should be to please God. Everything else becomes secondary. Our spouses, our children, the only reason we get joy from this is because God has provided for us. Because these joys can also turn into uh, misery if we don't make God our priority. And God has given each of us, again, so many blessings. And it's our duty not to turn these blessings into idols to have it occupy our mind the majority of the day, to make it our priority. Our priority should always be God. God should always occupy our minds the majority of the day. 
It should be something that just resonates within us that we're always thinking about God. We're always conscientious of God. And we do this with simple practices. We mention God's name before we eat. Before we say we we're going to do anything in the future, we say God willing. When we see something beautiful, we see a sunset, we see the moon, you know, we see a beautiful landscape, we see an awesome car, we say mashallah, we say subhanallah, glory be to God. This is what God has given me. In these ways, by continuously glorifying God, we make God more and more part of our life to the point that we realize that all the joy we have, all the righteousness we obtain comes only from God alone. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.